everyone. Thanks for making your way in. We are going to start at the top of the hour. Welcome everyone. We will start at the top of the hour. All right, well, I think we are going to get started now. Um, my name is Julianne Baruti, and I am Senior Director of Forest Carbon Innovation at Vera. Uh, welcome to this webinar. We are super excited to launch our new afforestation, reforestation, and revegetation methodology and its associated module for estimating leakage. Um, just a few housekeeping details at the top here. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we'll post it on the Vera website and it will be shared with participants in, in like 24 hours tomorrow sometime. Um, we will ask, and I see that some of you have already discovered this, you can use the question and answer dialogue box to um, ask your, put your questions in. We will save questions um, that we don't get to today to you to inform our frequently asked questions document. Um, and then we hope to answer some of the more relevant questions at the end, but we are there's a lot of information that we want to share. So we are not planning on answering very many of those questions, but do submit them and we will try to get to all of them as we um, in the coming weeks. So um, the people on, that you see on the screen with me are um, the main developers of this uh, webinar or this methodology, who are um, David Schock from and Scott Settlemeyer from Terra Carbon, and Spencer Plum from Vera, and um, Max Gigeri from also from Vera. Um, so they, Mac, David and Scott will be presenting um, the, the majority of the webinar. Spencer will be introducing it and um, Max will be helping us to respond to questions. So thanks everyone for um, joining. Next slide, please. A little bit of what the, we initiated this process way back in 2020, 2020. And the reason that we had this idea to have a, a new afforestation, reforestation and revegetation methodology is because there was, we thought we could improve on the CDM methodologies that have been currently, or, and are currently in use in this methodology or in the, the VCS program. So the we um, issued one of our first calls for Vera uh, developed methodology, and we hired Scott and we hired Terra Carbon um, to to contribute to the 
to this methodology. And along the way, so other people at Terra Carbon have contributed. So John Furness, Rebecca D Dickens Dixon, and Devin Erickson, and others from Sylvestrum, including Gino Emmer, and then others from the Abacus Working Group, so Kyle Hemmes in, in particular. And then there are other people from Vera who've also been instrumental in the in the development of this methodology, like Ceci Simon and Abel, um, who has now left Vera. Um, we so we in in developing this methodology, we use the rigorous BCS methodology development and review process, which involves the development process, and then and then a public consultation process, and then a rigorous review by a third party. Um, in this case, the, the validation verification body, Aster Global, reviewed this methodology. So it took us three years to do this, but we think the product that came out is super um, useful um, and is really innovative. Uh, and you'll learn more about that now. Um, and I think that is, that's all for me. So I'll turn it over to Spencer. Thanks, Julie, um, for getting us started. And we're, like Julie said, really excited to be here. Um, what I'm going to cover today is an overview of um, the methodology um, and the applicability conditions. Uh, and then I'll get into how the methodology is structured, um, our two different approaches in the methodology, which include the census-based approach and an area-based approach that uses a dynamic performance benchmark. Um, and then we'll have uh, an overview of the leakage module um, that's been developed in association with this methodology and must be used with uh, this methodology. We'll wrap up um, the presentation with question and answer and a bit of a preview of next phases because uh, we see this as uh, a milestone, but certainly not the end point of this process. So um, that's uh, just a, a bit of, of where we're headed here. Um, I think to, to start, we just want to say, you know, we're really excited to have a, a methodology coming out that is focused on uh, nature-based solutions and in particular uh, carbon removals. Um, so all credits issued from this methodology will be considered uh, removals and will be labeled as such um, under the, the VCS registry. Um, the methodology covers afforestation, reforestation, and revegetation activities. And um, Vera's definition of ARR or um, afforestation, reforestation, revegetation activities includes increasing uh, carbon stocks in woody biomass um, by establishing increasing and by establishing increasing and restoring vegetative cover through planting, sowing and or the human assisted natural regeneration of woody vegetation. So that's the, the scope of activities that are eligible under this methodology. The two accounting approaches that we've laid out in this um, are designed for, for sort of two different purposes. The first is the census-based approach, and this is uh, likely to be used with uh, smaller projects with uh, maybe multiple or many instances um, that are not increasing uh, or changing land use or, or land cover. Um, and so we have a constraint on, uh, on the census-based approach that, it, uh, that activities will not exceed uh, one hectare of forest cover. Um, and so um, this was uh, designed specifically for these, these smaller landowners um, because we recognize that the dynamic performance benchmark that's used in the area-based approach is relatively complex. And there are instances where um, by demonstrating certain preconditions in a project um, that we may be able to conservatively assume a zero baseline. Um, and uh, we, we just ensure that all projects that are using the census-based approach are uh, meeting those criteria and that we can, can assume that without project activity, 
um, the, the growth of uh, trees or, or other woody vegetation is highly unlikely. In the census-based approach, um, we require that all planting units, so be that trees or other woody vegetation, is census at the uh, start of the project. And so that means, um, as indicated in our diagram here, uh, basically you have a number and location associated with, with every single planting unit at the time that they go into the ground. Um, but, but we wanna make sure that folks understand that this does not mean a census in terms of measurement is required. Once the initial census is established, uh, project uh, uh, measurement can be done through sampling and then scaled by the uh, tree uh, or, or census of all trees, but not by the area of the project. So the amount of land that the project covers does not drive uh, the, the quantification of carbon stocks. It's the number of planting units that have gone into the ground. So that's a really important distinction for the census-based approach and, and how we um, uh, have differentiated that from the area-based approach. Um, key thing to take away there is that the tree itself is the, um, the, the area or the, the unit at which measurement is taking place. The area-based approach is the approach where we uh, use the dynamic performance benchmark, leveraging remote sensing to compare the project uh, to an external, con uh, external control plot, uh, all of which are remotely sensed. And the comparison between those two uh, project and control plots are made using um, uh, the dynamic performance benchmark, which sets crediting baseline and additionality. And Scott will get, or uh, David will get into this um, here in a bit and, and we'll spend much of the time today just making sure that this is uh, as clear as possible because this is really where the innovation in this methodology lies is, is using this remote sensing uh, approach to, um, to set a dynamic performance benchmark. Um, important here to note that the area-based approach scales uh, carbon stocks by the area of the project, not by the individual um, planting units. And so this is where you do set an area for where all activities are occurring. And then uh, as we, uh, or as a project can demonstrate that carbon stocks are increasing over that area um, uh, through, through plot or through directly measured plots, um, then, um, those measurements get, uh, get applied to the entire area of the project. So with that um, sort of framework in mind, this is how the methodology is just generally structured. Um, and so we, we have our area-based approach um, and it requires the use of this performance uh, method in, in the appendix. So this is the dynamic performance benchmark um, and all of the requirements and all of the uh, steps for setting that up are included in the, the appendix one of the methodology. Um, the area-based approach has a slightly different set of conditions, which are uh, contained in the methodology itself, but separated out. And so as you read through the methodology, you'll see demarcations that note uh, area-based approach or census-based approach. And that includes in um, the equations in particular, but then in other sections like additionality, you'll see uh, different re requirements. So pay attention to those as you go through the methodology. Uh, census-based approach, um, uh, everything apply that applies to the census-based approach is contained within the core methodology. But then, like I, I said at the top, uh, both the area-based and approach and census-based approach require the use of the leakage module, which is uh, a separate document and it's VMD 54. Um, and so you'll find all of the requirements for uh, accounting for leakage from project activities um, in, that, in that document. And Scott Settlemeyer will walk us through that uh, today. So in the core methodology, there are um, a couple key things that, that either 
census-based or area-based projects uh, must meet. So these are some shared criteria of, of what counts. So this methodology is applicable where project activities can increase vegetative cover. Um, and um, like I, I said at the beginning, that can be afforestation, reforestation, or revegetation activities. Um, but any project using this methodology should be able to, to demonstrate that. Um, the area-based approach, census-based approach or a combination can be used um, uh, for, for these projects. Um, we've designed this uh, specifically so that depending on the project activity, uh, you are required to use one or the other. It is not a choice as to which approach you are using. So based on the, the uh, type of, of activity and the scale at which it's happening, you'll, be, uh, you'll, you'll have to use one or the other. Um, and then, like I said, they can be used in combination. However, as we demonstrate here in the bottom diagram, those areas cannot overlap. And this is uh, intended to prevent any sort of double counting or any risk of double counting. So those project areas uh, must be separate and uh, separated, I believe, by a 10 meter um, buffer. Um, so uh, it is possible to have like a, a grouped project where you have um, one group that's doing area-based approach and then another part of the project where census-based uh, approach is being used. However, those cannot be um, uh, connected physically. The methodology is not uh, eligible for use in places where, um, or in projects where there is removal or burning of significant pre-existing uh, woody biomass. And um, in particular, dead, uh, dead wood, we already have uh, requirements in the standard that prevent the, the use of the methodology where uh, clearing of forest has occurred within the last 10 years. We go a step further here um, to ensure that we are able to account for all pools um, of, of carbon and we're not uh, missing any. And so that's why we put this requirement in place that if we can't account for it, um, then, uh, or if, if there's a risk that we would have missed it uh, during project prep, um, then uh, those projects are, are ineligible. That doesn't mean that you can't move that material. It just must, it just must remain on site or within the project boundary. Um, projects are also, projects that take place on tidal wetlands are also not eligible. Um, we have a new uh, or a revision to VM 33 that should be coming out and that will be a more appropriate methodology for projects occurring in tidal wetlands or mangroves. Um, projects are also not eligible that occur on organic soils or wetlands and manipulate the water table. It's important to note here that both these conditions, uh, if they are met, then those projects are, in, are ineligible. However, however, if just one of those conditions are met, such as planting in a wetland, um, but you're planting a native species that can be demonstrated to grow in wetlands, that's not considered a manipulation of the water table. And so those project activities would be allowed uh, as long as you meet all conditions um, of the methodology. Um, where projects do take place on wetlands, they, they can uh, use or be combined uh, with other WRC methodologies. Um, however, uh, uh, that must be demonstrated for or all applicability conditions for both this methodology and the WRC methodologies uh, must be met. So I'll talk briefly here about the, the census-based approach in a little more detail, and then I'll turn it over uh, to David. So as I, uh, I noted earlier, um, the census-based approach uh, scales um, all quantification by the number of trees or the census of trees that were planted. So that census is super important for understanding the total number of trees. And then any sort of sampling that's done quantifies 
both carbon stocks at the tree level and then also the, the mortality rates, um, which, which must be factored into accounting as well. Um, this approach uses a project-based method. So um, there are really strict criteria on uh, where the project can be used. And um, some of those criteria include um, only in places where um, uh, land use uh, has does not have existing forest cover. So we need to see that it's unlikely based on the vegetation or land use that currently exists that forests would occur naturally or through some other means. Um, and so these uh, project level criteria uh, are specified in the methodology and are intended to uh, constrain the types of projects that can use this. Um, however, we, we do believe that there's lots of applications for this methodology, particularly small landowners and, and grouped projects uh, where planting either around a homestead or perhaps in urban settings um, are not creating forest cover. Um, and those planting activities are uh, intended to increase carbon stocks, but, but um, not create a, a forest per se on those, uh, those areas. Um, projects must uh, not produce uh, this continuous uh, tree cover. And so that's really where we're trying to, to prevent any sort of uh, large scale conversion uh, in the census based approach. Um, and then I think I've covered all the other criteria here that uh, uh, census based approach must not uh, have instances that create forest cover exceeding one hectare. So then uh, to just give a little preview and, and kind of demonstrate how this approach is uh, somewhat simplified compared to the area-based approach, um, we, we really have a, a simple set of equations to walk through. There's uh, direct measurements of carbon removals that occur uh, due to the project. We, we also need to account for project emissions from biomass burning and from fertilizer use. And then we get to sum up those, um, uh, those emissions and removals in our summary equations. We include our uncertainty estimates um, and then where uh, we get an estimate of total carbon removal. So this approach is fairly straightforward. It's designed to be that way so that it is, it is uh, easier for, um, for group projects to be using. And um, really this just illustrates that, that uh, we, we hope that this is a, a way for small landowners to be able to participate um, and be included in group projects with uh, rigorous but uh, minimal requirements in terms of, um, of how they participate and how quantification is performed. And I will turn it over to David uh, at this point. Thanks, Spencer. So I am going to walk through the area-based approach. And to start, um, it's good to point out that um, compared to the census-based approach, it's, it's more traditional uh, in terms of MRV, where the activity data is area or hectares, whereas the census-based approach, the activity data is the just tree count, the number of trees involved. Um, one thing I also wanted to point out is that, you know, despite the incorporation of remote sensing, which we'll talk about a little later, it is still reliant on direct field measurement for the estimation with project carbon stocks. Um, what's different is the incorporation of a dynamic performance benchmark for the demonstration of additionality and setting crediting baselines, which I'll explain further in the next few slides. The accounting boundary is broader than the census-based approach, which is restricted to the tree itself, again, census-based. And should look familiar to those we have uh, worked who to those of you who have worked previously with CDM methodology. So all those carbon pools and GHG sources um, that are covered in the CDM methodology are also covered here. Um, advance the slide. And this um, here we have like just a brief overview of the the structure, uh, the calculation flow, which as you can see is more involved in this, the census based approach as it includes more pools and sources, as well as the performance benchmark and leakage. Um, direct measures, you can see at the top, um, it serves the basis for the delta carbon term, 
delta CWP that you see at the bottom in equation 30, which is the final net removals calculation. Um, and over there, project emissions, those non-CO2 GHG emissions are calculated applying IPCC default values. And finally, I, I wanted you to take note of how the performance benchmark is applied in equation 30. So you've got direct measures of stock change, that's that delta CWP term, and it's multiplied times one minus the performance benchmark. And so the performance benchmark is applied as a percent deduction to those direct measured stock changes. Next slide. So onto the performance benchmark itself. The performance benchmark represents relative stock change between matched controls and project plots evaluated on the basis of remote sensing. The selection of matched control plots is made on the basis of the criteria outlined in this table here that you'll, you'll also see in the methodology. And it's done once at the beginning of the project. The matching process uses exact matching for categorical spatially explicit variables and also uses nearest neighbor or most similar matching for a historic time series of stocking indices. Stocking index is a user-defined index derived from remote sensing with a demonstrated correlation with above ground biomass. It can be something as simple as canopy cover. The power of using a time series of stocking indices to drive the match is that the trend in vegetation represented is our outcome of interest, ultimately, and integrates a whole series of other inferential variables related to productivity and stock change, like soil type, elevation, aspect, et cetera, which you do not see included in the table here, but are represented in those historic trends that are evaluated in the selection of controls. Next slide. So this process of evaluating and selecting match controls is carried out repeatedly for a representative sample of project plots. And plots here being fixed aggregates of pixels. These aren't plots, these aren't physical measures that you visit in the field. Which leads to another important point about matching is ultimately for the performance benchmark, we want to produce a reliable estimate of comparative stock change at the project scale, which requires a population of many matched project and control plots. And it's a simple example. We have three project plots here, each with different historic trends, as you can see. So some with a sort of flat line of historic stocking indices represented by annual cropping, for example, um, another with a sort of oscillating um, uh, stocking indices that would represent sort of fallow cycles. Um, and then um, also an upward trend that might be represented by sort of a slow, steady rate of natural regeneration in a business as usual case. Um, and essentially these, these uh, historic trends, you know, we, they represent expected without project outcomes and they're matched to multiple similar control plots drawn from the donor pool. So you can see these plots in, within the project area, they're representatively sampled, and then each is independently matched to similar um, plots from the control pool, this donor pool that we call it, um, surrounding the project area and outside the project area. And finally, before moving into an example of an actual application of the performance benchmark, I wanted to call out the improvements that are offered by this dynamic baseline approach over more traditional baselines using fixed assumptions. And first off, it's conceptually simple. Essentially, it, what we're framing here is an experiment. You've got treatments and paired controls. And two, the baseline is set from actual observations. It's not a model baseline. And finally, three, it allows for improved attribution of results by tracking comparative performance of the project ex post compared to the controls that have been matched we're essentially controlling for externalities outside of the project proponents control like policy markets and climate change. And so we're gonna get improved attribution and we're not gonna have sort of um, emission reductions awarded on the basis of sort of spurious results um, or less so in the case of fixed historic baseline. So this is, this is an important improvement that we wanted to call out and, and the reason why we've employed it here. Uh, move on to next slide. So here onto a real world example of applying performance benchmark approach um, here, uh, we have a historic represented planting in Brazil that was initiated in 2016. And the stocking index here, uh, as again, it's a user defined stocking index, but here we used um, normalized degradation fraction index. 
which is an index derived from Landsat and has been used previously to track degradation in the Amazon. Here, we're looking at it to observe other sorts of vegetation dynamics. Um, and again, those relevant to, um, to removals, accounting removals in this methodology. So in the years prior to the project start date, it's the, from 2006 to 2016, we're looking at specific time points and stocking indices that represent the historic trend of vegetation free project. So that, that represents the business usual case in a without project scenario. And that becomes an important basis for the selection of the match controls. And then after the project start date, once the controls have been selected, the performance of the project evaluated with remote sensing that you can see post 2016 here in an increase in NDFI value is then compared to those matched controls where no treatment has occurred. Next slide. So here's a, an example of the outcome of the control plot selections. And you can see the project area um, in the center. It's a, a black outlined polygon. And it has been matched, uh, applying all the exact matching criteria and the nearest neighbor matching criteria to this uh, suite of control points um, within the 100 kilometer radius. Next slide. Another um, important um, point I wanted to bring up is um, that um, the, uh, the match quality um, has to be assessed before the final selection of controls is made. And there are thresholds um, related to that. So here we're applying a uh, metric of goodness of fit of the match, essentially, um, using standardized difference of means. And it's basically a metric to describe the similarity of controls and treatments. And in this case, the methodology sets a minimum um, value of 0 0.25. So the lower that value is, the more similar, the less the difference in the means uh, between the control pool and the, and the treatment pool is. And so this has to be assessed across the vector of covariance. So here, the range of individual years in the historic time series of stocking indices. And so you can, you can see the, the improvements that are introduced through the matching process. So starting here, you've got a 100 kilometer radius in blue, and that represents some of the categorical uh, matching, exact matching criteria. So it, it, you've got the 100 kilometer search radius, that's geographic proximity, eco-region and uh, administrative unit are the same within that area. And then you move on to the donor pool. And so in this case, we've, we've um, added a, a categorical variable, which is allowed, and that's the initial land cover class. Um, and we've also added land tenure. And so we, we can see an improvement with that. And then finally, with the nearest neighbor matching, um, again, across that the whole time series, um, we have essentially obtained a, a far better um, pool of controls that better match the pre-existing conditions of the, of the project area than a random draw would. And you can sort of see that the blue lines would represent just essentially a random draw. Next slide. And then at the end of the day, this is, this is what, you, what you want to see in the application of this. So on the left, um, and the, again, the x-axis is time, it's years. On the y-axis is the stocking index. It's um, simply a metric between zero and one. And on the left uh, are historic time points that are driving the nearest neighbor matching. And the project plots are pluses and the control plots, the matched controls are the, um, are the uh, circles. And you can see after applying the match criteria and, and running the match, we've got good fits across that time series. It's met the standardized difference of means criteria. The match is formalized and would be entered into the project description. And then those controls would be monitored along with the project plots themselves over time. And so here we have from time zero to time 16, a time series of ex post monitored values of the stocking index um, comparing the, the project and the controls. And you see in this case, the controls are essentially matching the same trend that they had um, at pre-project. And the project following tree planting 
has a uh, significantly um, steep slope. And um, the performance benchmark is the ratio of the of the uh, the slope of the controls to the project area. And in this case, where the slope of the controls is zero, the crediting baseline, the performance benchmark is zero. There's no deduction that's applied. And that's the case here where there's, the slope is not significantly different than zero. Onward, next slide. I think I think on to Scott. Scott, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to provide a quick summary of the leakage module. BMD 54, uh, which must be applied by all projects using um, the new methodology VM 47. Um, the module uses a standardized approach that goes beyond previous approaches um, that focused only on activity shifting um, and instead um, takes a more comprehensive approach to estimate leakage emissions that are caused uh, by the displacement of agricultural and fuel wood production uh, that occurred in the project area prior to the project start date. Uh, whether those emissions are caused by um, the baseline agent or by other actors uh, responding to market effects. Next slide, please. Uh, the module uses a production-based approach and it, it includes methods uh, and it creates an incentive for project proponents to actively mitigate leakage uh, by supporting intensification efforts in designated leakage mitigation areas uh, that are located outside the project area, but within the region where the production commodity is displaced. And ne next slide, please. Um, leakage uh, must be assessed for the first five years of the project, which is when the effects of, of leakage from displaced production are expected to occur. Um, and the, the leakage procedures um, in, in the module are organized into five steps. Um, and the module includes an example in the appendix to illustrate um, how they all work. Uh, in summary, the first step is to determine uh, foregone production in the project area as measured in units of production for uh, the relevant commodity. Uh, so for example, metric tons of grain or, or head of livestock. Um, foregone production is measured by reference to historical production um, in the project area over the historical reference period, uh, which is the greater of three years or one complete crop rotation. Um, and it applies a production growth rate um, that is either observed or, um, or uses a default growth rate um, of two and a half percent to estimate that baseline production. Um, baseline production is then compared to actual production, uh, which could be zero in cases where, where no further agricultural or fuel wood production occurs in the project area, or it could be a reduced amount um, in cases where uh, livestock or crop production is still compatible uh, with the reforestation activities. Uh, the second step is to account for leakage mitigation activities uh, in the designated leakage mitigation areas. Um, leakage mitigation areas must be in the same uh, production region uh, for the crop that's being displaced in the project area. Uh, they need to be geographically delineated and uh, there needs to be a written agreement in place with the landowner uh, regarding the leakage mitigation activities that, that take place. Uh, finally, those areas, the leakage mitigation areas cannot overlap with other uh, leakage mitigation areas to, to avoid double counting. Um, the, the leakage, uh, the baseline production in the leakage mitigation areas are calculated 
um, in the same way as they are in, in the project area um, by referencing historical production. Um, and again, they're compared to actual production um, in, in the leakage mitigation area. And of course, any increases, um, you know, any amounts of actual production in excess of the baseline are considered um, leakage mitigation. Um, and that that amount, uh, the leakage mitigation um, is subtracted from the amount of foregone production in the project area uh, to determine the foregone production that's subject to leakage. Um, so that takes us to the third step. Uh, which is uh, to determine the amount of new land that needs to be brought into production. Um, it's measured in hectares. Um, and that's the amount of land needed to compensate for uh, the foregone production uh, that's subject to leakage. So it's based on um, the amount of foregone production, uh, the regional commodity yields uh, for uh, the production that's foregone. And then um, third, um, it's based on default values for the amount of supply uh, that is replaced um, and the amount of new land that's needed um, to replace it, um, considering that some supply um, can be provided by increasing yields um, on existing agricultural lands. The, the fourth step is to estimate the carbon stock changes um, in the new lands that are brought into production. So this includes uh, carbon stock changes in biomass and soils. Um, it's conservatively assumed that all new lands uh, that are brought into production are forested. Uh, carbon stock data uh, that is used for this step um, should be relevant to the region and it should be sourced from country specific data. Um, and if that's not available, it can be derived from IPCC um, data. And in the fifth uh, and final step, uh, you determine leakage emissions, which is calculated uh, based on uh, the area of the new land that's brought into production, uh, the uh, estimated carbon stock change that would occur, uh, and that's all converted um, into CO2 equivalent. Um, I'll end by saying that uh, Appendix 2 of the module provides um, support and rationale for all the default values that uh, have been included in the module and, um, you know, suggest um, taking a look at that as well. Uh, so I think I'll hand it back over to Spencer now to talk about next phases. Thanks, Scott. Um, so. Yeah, we just wanted to touch on what comes next. Uh, like I said, this is not the, an endpoint by any means. So uh, a couple of things to, to put on everyone's radar. We are expecting to go to a public consultation with a draft of the abacus label that will accompany um, this uh, ARR methodology. At, at current, the abacus label will only be applied to the ARR methodology. Um, and is a label that uh, helps demonstrate that projects go sort of above and beyond what's uh, in, in this uh, methodology and um, has some, some additional um, requirements associated with that um, and is also a, a testing ground for new concepts and, and ways to um, try out innovation. So we're excited to release that with the uh, abacus working group leading the way on that. So keep an eye out that for that. It'll it's likely to come out in the next several weeks. Um, we are already uh, collecting uh, uh, recommendations for how to improve the methodology. I think that was that was happening as soon as we we released it. Um, so we appreciate that. You all are reading it closely and thinking about it critically, and uh, we know that we can we can always be improving on these things. So first, there will be an errata and clarification just to catch any any um, uh, uh, any mistakes that we made or you know that we didn't catch in, in our many reviews. Um, so we'll we'll do we'll issue 
errata and clarification in the coming weeks. And uh, we're already, like I said, gathering input. Um, so your, your emails about ways to improve or questions on, on how certain things work and if they're confusing, you know, we are, we are listening to that, uh, compiling that, and then looking for, um, you know, ways to synthesize that and, and how to integrate that into the methodology. So that's an ongoing um, effort on our part. And there will be more announcements about that as, as we uh, reach out for a more formal um, uh, process to, to gather information. So keep an eye out for those opportunities. The, the questions that we're getting in the chat today, um, we're going to, to use those to help populate a frequently asked questions document that will be on our website that, is, that uh, goes along with the ARR methodology. So that should be a, you know, a first stop resource for anybody that's interested in using the methodology. Um, will contain a lot of the information that was covered today, plus uh, additional sort of things that, that maybe we missed, um, but uh, that we see people are curious about. So um, your questions are, are going to good use, even if we can't get to an answer to them today, uh, keep an eye out for the FAQ doc um, uh, when it comes out. And then uh, we also recognize the importance of, of providing training uh, on this new methodology as it does uh, use the dynamic performance benchmark and the validation and verification bodies. Uh, we wanna ensure are all on the same page about how these approaches are to be used and assessed um, and uh, validated and verified. So um, that'll be uh, forthcoming and, and we're working internally to um, set those dates and get trainings on the calendar. Uh, I also want to mention that um, at, with the release of this methodology, we are um, initiating a grace period for the CDM AR methodology. So um, projects that are that we're planning to use the CDM methodology and are either in projects um, pipeline listing phase or, or uh, intend to list on the pipeline have three months to go under validation um, uh, with Vera. And then once under validation or any projects that are currently under validation, um, any projects that are not yet validated have a total of 15 months uh, to achieve validation. Um, and at that point, uh, those CDM projects will be able to continue to operate However, um, that's how we're, we're phasing into this new methodology is giving projects that are coming in through the pipeline uh, an opportunity to get in and then, and then we're uh, transitioning fully over to this methodology. So there is uh, an announcement about that on our website, but just thought I would mention it here and hopefully that provides additional clarity. I think with that, um, we can turn over to question and answer session. And um, so Max, if you want to come on screen and then maybe David and Scott, if you're also available, um, we can um, go to that session. All right, great. Thanks, Spencer, for passing it over here. Um, all right, I pulled some, some messages from the Q&A. Um, I will try and pose them to the correct person, but uh, if I'm getting that off, please feel free to jump in. Um, so first question uh, is for David, um, and the question is, how should developers navigate the uncertainty associated with the new dynamic performance benchmark? Yeah, sure. sure. So uh, introducing this ex post look back baseline obviously introduces uncertainty in terms of what the uh, what the baseline is going to be. And we knew it was important to provide clear guidance on ex ante projections to inform project finance and implementation. Uh, and, and so what we, what we have in the methodology, we have a section covering that, and essentially it hinges on the historic time series of stocking indices that are observed in the project area. And that historic time series represents the likely outcomes in well-matched control plots in the future. And so leveraging that same information that's being used to drive those matches provides an indication of near-term five to 10 year 
outcomes in terms of performance benchmarks and baselines and expected emission reductions. And the, the other point I would add is that it, unlike IFM and RED, these, these sorts of um, land landscapes and changes where ARR activity is going to take place, they, they don't feature highly volatile baselines in terms of a per unit area basis. You'll have massive stocks per unit area that are being emitted. It's sort of slow, steady, and the recent past is the best indication of the future. Great. Thank you, David. Um, while you're on the mic, I, I have one or two more for you there. Um, next one, um, for the historic time period to monitor the stocking index for control and project plots, there are a minimum of three timestamps that must be monitored. Two of these are ranges um, T minus 10 to T minus 8 and T minus 8 to T minus 1. Do the time selected within those regions, ranges have to be the same across all the plots? Um, so so is this, does it refer to like, in, in, like individual plot matches or, so we've got a, we've got a time series, there's a minimum of three and the, the flexibility that's provided in that definition rep, recognizes the fact that, you know, there, there are issues with imagery, especially if we're doing these historic look packs to drive the matches, we're probably going to have to rely on optical imagery like Landsat. And so obviously there are issues with cloud cover. Um, and so that's why we've provided some flexibility there. But um, beyond that, there's there's no um, further requirements regarding you know, distance between those three plus um, time points. Um, but I I think you know that what I would we would recommend is that everyone uses as much data as they can, as they can get their hands on. And when we've run our trials, we've, we've been able to obtain um, stocking indices for every, every year in that 10 year time series. Great, thanks David. Uh, one more for you here. Um, the performance benchmark stratification requires data sets at 30 meter resolution, uh, which rules out uh, some information like participa uh, precipitation is not available in parts of the world at 30 meter resolution. Uh, can we include data sets like these that are not feasible at 30 meter resolution for the matching criteria? Yes, they can, they can be included in the exact matching criteria. So the, the pool, I believe, I think it's table A1 in the appendix, uh, the exact matching criteria, those are the spatially explicit categorical variables. You can introduce other variables that aren't included there that are have demonstrated um, correlation with stock change, like precipitation, you can add that in there. Um, so, so yes, that's that's where you, you wouldn't add it in as a uh, nearest neighbor matching covariate, but you'd add it in at that step. But again, I would I would remind everyone that a, a lot of these these variables that we that we know are just sort of drivers of productivity, soil type, things like that, they are integrated into that historic time series of stocking indices. And so you may you may have sort of minimal improvement by adding a, a, another matching um, covariate. Great, thank you, David. Um, all right, I think maybe we'll move toward a couple questions regarding the leakage module for you, Scott. Um, first one here, uh, in the census-based approach, uh, can the existing natural material that will grow on the project area be accounted in the carbon estimation, or is this only the trees that are being have that are have been planted thanks to the project? Maybe I'll flip that question. It's not necessarily a leakage question. It's yeah. Maybe back to David or Spencer on that one. I I can go. I can grab that one. So um, so no. Uh, when we're accounting for um each tree as the activity data, uh, it means that the, the boundary is just around that tree. So just the carbon associated with that tree, the growth of other uh, woody vegetation or other plants uh, cannot be included. And that's why we, we require the census. So when we have that location with a, or with a number, with a location, um, 
uh, we should be able to go back to that tree and know that it was planted and that's what you get credit for. And so, yeah, just to add to that, you know, again, that approach hinges on the tree as a counting boundary itself. And essentially the baseline is the absence of that tree. It's, it's that zero baseline. It must meet all those criteria um, to essentially justify that. And, um, and so, yes, then. Great. Thanks, guys. All right. I, I actually have a leakage question for you now, Scott. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, the sheer scale of determining foregone production in project area, step one, uh, for thousands of smallholder farmers, often semi literate, with no agriculture records in, uh, with no agriculture rec records is impractical. I believe the perception is there will be large landowners with is not the case. Determining leakage emissions and associated MRV will be substantial and almost certainly outweigh expected income from carbon offsets. Um, not a question posed, but any comment, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, no, I can comment on that. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there is, um, uh, there is a sort of priority or preference of of data sources for determining historical production. And like the first preference is is grower records, um, and um, in the event that those aren't available, the module uh, then allows the use of of regional averages, uh, sort of acknowledging that like data, historical records may be spotty in certain areas. So if we we don't have historical records, then we then we uh, then we use the sort of regional average for that commodity. Uh, to determine, estimate like historical production. Great, thank you, Scott. All right, uh, Spencer, I think I have a, a couple questions for you, um, relatively yes or no. But if you want to add more, please do. Um, first one: uh, What about large-scale uh, smallholder agroforestry projects? So, I think we're talking about. Uh, many farms of less than one hectare, does uh, that fit into the census or the area-based approach? So uh, if the instance itself um, is less, is creating, uh, is planting on less than one hectare or creating forest cover on less than one hectare, then it can be, you can have as many as you can get in a group project. So you could have many uh, small landowners under one hectare, and they could all be included in in the census based approach. Um, if you're getting projects or, or including uh, landowners that have greater than that one hectare scale, you could uh, hypothetically have a grouped project where you have an area based approach for landowners that have more than one hectare that are included, and then a census based approach uh, for those areas um, not included in that in that area-based approach. And we just would point out that there, there is a 10 meter buffer between those areas, but uh, you can have those both under uh, one project. Great, thank you, Spencer. All right, uh, one more here uh, for the census-based approach. Uh, we understand that a full initial census is required, but the verification and biomass can be carried out at the statistical sample basis. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, let's see, one more here. Um, one for you, David. Um, hi, David, you mentioned that stock indices could be as simple as canopy cover. Could you mention other examples, something like NDVI or similar vegetation indices? Uh, or total biomass from RS products like MAP Biomass? Yeah, so um, some of the ones we've been exploring, like I said, is the um, uh, Normalized Degradation Fraction Index, which is derived from Landsat. Um, uh, there are others um, who are looking at NDVI. There's percent cover. Um, I think in the future, especially for monitoring um, some of the LIDAR based uh, LIDAR satellites like JEDI um, might be good to like, you could use um, average LIDAR um, um, 
interpreted canopy height as a stocking index. Um, I think I, one thing I wanted to point out is um, we, we the methodology is intentionally not prescriptive on this. We recognize that technology is changing and evolving quickly, and we want to accommodate and encourage that. And so as long as uh, there is a demonstrated correlation uh, with above ground biomass that, that can be used, it would, it would need to be validated, obviously, um, uh, in the project development process, but um, it's it essentially wide open. And I would say the Mapiomas, which uh, that was referenced, um, uses NDFI, to my knowledge. All right. Um, it looks like we are right at the top of the hour. And um, make sure we want to uh, give our speakers time to get to their, their next uh, meeting. So really want to thank uh, David, Scott, Max, Julie, um, and all the other folks from Vera that have helped put this webinar on. Uh, we're really excited about getting this methodology out there. And thank you all for attending and please um, be in touch with us with your questions and, and comments. We look forward to hearing that and um, excited to, to see this methodology put to good work. Um, and uh, just wanna, wanna say thanks for, for your patience. And, and we know it's been a long process, but um, let's, let's go use it.